to go forward. Okay, so today uh, we are going to start talking about your novel. Um, so this is kind of a dramatic departure from the things that we've read so far. So I'm very interested uh, to hear on, on Thursday what you guys thought about this one, because this is one of the sort of like all-time great books. Uh, so it's sort of considered one of the like classics of Western literature, like what, you know, it's one of the things that we assign students a lot. So it may have come up in your life before, uh, but I'm interested to hear what you think about that as well. So what we're going to do today, uh, just in case you haven't gotten as far in the novel as perhaps one would like, um, is to talk about the author and his experience and like the book and how it was received in the world. Um, and a little bit about the first movie. So they've made two or three versions of this movie, uh, or movie versions of this book. So I'll tell you a little bit about the first one, just because it was historically relevant. Uh, so let's begin. So today, uh, we're going to really get into All Quiet on the Western Front. And again, this is sort of one of the great big classics. Like this is one of the books uh, that everybody talks about, and for good reason, as you probably noticed, since I imagine you're finished with it by now. Um, so what I wanted to tell you about first was the author. So. Here he is, Erich Maria Remarque. Um, and you may notice that he has a French name and his family went back and forth on the spelling. Sometimes they spelled it with a more German spelling like um, R-E-M-A-R-C-K. But he tended to spell it with a French version, uh, which will become a problem later, you'll see. So basically, um, in a lot of ways, he was just a normal dude. He was born into kind of a middle-class household. Um, he was born in a relatively small, boring village and he, himself was always kind of moody and dramatic. Um, so he started writing novels relatively young. Uh, his first book that he ever published was when he was 16. And he was embarrassed by it. He didn't, he didn't talk about it anymore after that. Um, and he tried to get it uh, removed from publication because apparently it was terrible and like just super moody. But um, you know, that's what happens when you're 16, right? So basically, um, the, the point at which his life really began to change dramatically was with the onset of World War I. So like we talked about last week, um, basically everyone in Germany, every man in Germany was conscripted. And conscription is sort of like being drafted, except that you have a little bit more choice in regard to where you go. So for Germany during World War I, uh, the war effort itself was spread out in a lot of areas. So you might be assigned to the front like he was, but you might also be assigned to hospitals or to farming or to like desk work. Like there were essentially a lot of jobs in which a person could be involved. Um, and so basically every man had to serve in some regard, uh, 17 to 45, I think. Basically, every healthy adult man had to do something. So he was conscripted um, into the, the land service, essentially. There he is, uh, right before he goes off to war. And he went to the Western Front. So that's going to be important later as well, uh, because people over the course of, like, writing about this book and criticizing this book did question his servants. Uh, the Nazi party especially tried to argue that in fact he hadn't been in the war, but there's like a lot of independent records he was there. Um, and he was injured a lot. Um, and again, that was a really common byproduct of the war. Uh, there was just so much shrapnel. Um, and so, you know, many, many bullets and bombs and that sort of thing. So over the course of his stint on the Western Front, he was injured at least five times that we know of, that we have medical records for. And the fifth injury was pretty significant. Um, so the fifth injury was the one that sent him um, to not just the field hospital, but he got repatriated. And repatriated is when you are essentially forcefully sent back to your country. So he got repatriated uh, to, the, to the hospital in Germany. So all of the scenes in the book where they're talking about, you know, men's relationships in the hospital and the way that like soldiers who are dying um, are treated by their fellow soldiers and by the doctors themselves. Again, all of that real. He was right there. So after the war, he had a whole lot of jobs. Um, so prior to the war, he had been training to be a teacher. So for a couple of years, he did. Uh, he taught elementary school, basically, uh, but he didn't like it. So he taught for a few years while he worked on his novel, this novel, uh, and while he worked on some other things. And then he went on this like sort of random journey where he worked all sorts of weird, like, um, you know, just like side gigs, uh, like driving cars and painting things and that sort of thing. Um, but finally, he finished his novel and he went through a lot of publishers. Not a lot of people wanted it, but he published it in 1929. So the book itself, we're going to talk about the reaction to it. But basically, he published it and it was a huge success. So for him, this was also a real game changer. So he went from like relatively normal dude to soldier to suddenly like, super famous, super rich, like super in demand. So in the first year, it sold 1.2 million, uh, which was a 
very significant amount also for the time period. Keep in mind that this was 1929. So now his whole life is different. Um, and this was in some ways really good uh, because he was already, you know, kind of um, dramatic and flamboyant. So he sort of loved having a bunch of money and being on the party scene and hanging out. Um, but on the other hand, it was quite dangerous because his book was so definitively honest um, about the war and especially about the negative realities of the war. So in a lot of ways, he became a target. Uh, so he was not just famous, he was also considered dangerous and he was considered kind of a liar. So again, we'll talk about this in a second, but uh, the Nazi party was pissed about this book and they were really, really mad at him. So they went after him um, in a lot of ways. They went after his French ancestry. Uh, they went after his religion. He was Roman Catholic. And the Nazis, very much like the uh, KKK, were pretty exclusively Protestant. And so anybody who was Jewish, obviously, was out, uh, but also anybody who was Catholic. Um, so very often with these sort of white supremacist groups, for some reason, they latch on to Protestantism, which is like, but why? Um, so they were really mad about his uh, Catholicism. Um, and they were basically just mad about his life. Uh, so they went on a full character assassination attack um, and a family attack, which we'll see in a second. So basically, when they started to come to power, he was like, all right, I'm out. Um, and he moved to Switzerland, which was a solid choice. Uh, this is the town where he lived, Ronco Sopra Espona. It's basically um, on the border of, of Switzerland and Italy. And I had to look it up because I had never heard of it. And now I'm like, oh, yeah, good choice. That looks really nice. <laughs> I would like to go there too. Um, so basically, when it started to get hot, he just kind of peaced out and moved to Switzerland, uh, which again, solid move. I would do it. So while he was in Switzerland, things got even worse. Um, so basically, while he was in Switzerland, they revoked his German citizenship um, and they started going after his family and they started publishing all of this stuff. So what he decided to do uh, was to move to America to escape the danger. So while he was in Switzerland and then while he was in America, uh, he started sort of like living this grand party life. And that was really annoying to the Nazis as well. Um, so basically he married and then divorced and then remarried the same woman, just, you know, for good mention. Uh, actually he had to remarry her because the Nazis took away her citizenship as well. Um, and then he moved to New York and just started hoeing around. Uh, you know, how, how we do. Um, so I wanted to show you these in case you've never seen these women because um, these are some of the most famous actresses of the day. Um, and for sure, some of the most beautiful women of all time. And Hedy Lamarr is especially fascinating. Like if you're interested in just going down like a Wikipedia wormhole or reading some like really scandalous biographies, I recommend Hedy Lamarr because um, she was super scandalous but also a straight up genius. She invented code skipping technology. She's like one of the reasons we have cell phones. I just love them. Um, so these are some of the women uh, with whom he had affairs. So he, you know, kind of a hoe, kind of a hoe, but you know, do what you do. And so while he was in America, uh, the Nazis sort of kept chasing him, but you, we have, you know, like extradition laws, and so they couldn't get to him. Um, so while he was in America, he like met a lot of really powerful people, and he became even more wealthy. Um, he eventually met and married Paulette Godard. And you may recognize her if you were in my 202 class because she's the, the waif from the Charlie Chaplin movie. Uh, she's the, uh, what did they call her? No, they called her the waif, like sort, of, like sort of the ingenue from the Charlie Chaplin films. Uh, she was in two of his biggest films and married him too. Or not, question mark, that part's confusing. Uh, but she did definitely uh, marry Lamarck. So there they are at some parties in New York and basically they had a grand time and they were like, oh, this is pretty dope. But then the other war started coming so they moved back to Switzerland. So while he was like essentially hiding out in New York, the Nazi party couldn't get a hold of him. And that made them really, really mad. So what they decided to do was go after his sister instead. Um, so basically they went after his sister who was like just a person and they convinced her landlord, uh, her landlady rather to turn her in. So they, they basically got her landlady to lie, question mark, but maybe not on record um, and say that his sister was destroying morale and that she was speaking out against the war effort and that she basically said that the Germans were gonna lose. Um, and so they tried her in a trial. And at the time, uh, uh, the Third Reich had this, like, the People's Court, the uh, Volksgerichtshof, and it was a farce, right? It was, it was basically just, like, a group of people who were employed and sponsored by the Nazi party, and they would bring people up, and they'd be like, isn't this person so very guilty, you know? And then the People's Court would be like, wow, so very guilty. Um, and then they would kill them. And so this is one of the reasons that um, we talk so much about like due process and about habeas corpus and about like the importance of a fast, a fair, a, a, 
like jury trial because things like this very often happen uh, where the trial is a farce and the decision is a farce and the accusations are a farce. And this was a prime example. So basically they told his sister uh, right before they beheaded her um, that they were really mad that they couldn't get a hold of her mark and so they were gonna kill her in his stead. And they did. Um, and he didn't find out about that for a little while because they weren't necessarily publishing um, what the what the Volksgerichtshof had done. This was another one of the things that the, the Nazis did and another one of those like historical perspective sort of incidents. A lot of what they did, they did not admit and they did not publish and they didn't always write it down. So he didn't find out for a couple of years uh, that they had done this to his sister. And so that was a real sort of breaking point um, in his life. And also just a great example of um, you know, straight up people. Not that I had to convince you, but you know what I mean. So after uh, World War II and after essentially everything had kind of calmed down, he went back to Switzerland um, and Paula Goddard went with him and they got married finally later on. They had been together for years um, and he lived to a pretty ripe old age, lived to 72, not so bad, especially for somebody who was in uh, World War I. Um, and he was buried in Switzerland and after his death, he had a pretty substantial amount of wealth um, from this book and from a series of other books that he wrote. He wrote a bunch of books. This was certainly the most famous, but he did sort of a sequel to this book. Um, and he wrote a few more books about the war and he acted as a consultant on a few more movies about the war. Um, so he built up a pretty substantial fortune. So did uh, Godard as well. So after his death, um, Godard donated all of his papers, like all of the like rough drafts, um, and like the initial paperwork for all of his books to NYU and also $20 million, which I bet they appreciated. Um, so what you see here is uh, the building that is named after them. It's a, a residence hall in New York. And remember, if you donate money, they'll name the building after you too. This is like our favorite thing. All right. So that's the guy who wrote it. Um, and again, he had a pretty exciting life. But the thing that you really need to remember is that he was there and he wrote an honest piece about what happened to him when he was there. Um, because that's the thing that's going to kind of come back and back again. So uh, this is the first edition of the book. I just wanted to show it to you because it's gorgeous. Invest in experience. Uh, so basically, he opened the book um, with this really beautiful introduction, which I imagine you've at least read this part, right? Um, and he basically was honest from the start um, about what this book was. And he wanted to be very clear that he wasn't going to sugarcoat anything. And this wasn't like um, meant to be glorifying the war in any way. So this is what he said. This book is to be neither an accusation nor a confession, and least of all an adventure, for death is not an adventure for those who stand face to face with it. It will try simply to tell of a generation of men who, even though they may have escaped its shells, were destroyed by the war. Powerful, powerful shit right there. So basically he's trying to, to open the book by explaining like, yeah, death is not exciting. War is not exciting. None of this is great. Like this is an honest account of what you sent, you know, your sons and neighbors out to do. Uh, basically when we make movies about war, very often we do make it look exciting and beautiful and dangerous. And he wanted to be very clear that it's not an adventure. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a death trap. Um, so basically, he wanted to speak for the generation of men uh, that he was a part of, this generation of men who had been sent to see this wretched, awful thing, um, and then sent right back home. And we have talked a little bit about shell shock, and we'll talk a little bit about it tomorrow, but this is one of the first generations who were like really reckoning with what they had seen. And for them, it was very difficult to come back home, to face their families, and to hear about what had been happening in the world while they were gone. Um, and that's also one of the things I'm sure you've noticed in the book, when he goes back home, and he's really struggling with this like community gossip. He's like, who cares about chickens, you know? Um, so I think this, this introduction is a really good summation of essentially what he wanted in this book and what he wanted people to see. So basically, beautiful introduction. All right, so when the book came out, uh, it was a huge success. And this was one of the first sort of like international bestsellers. Uh, we had seen, you know, bestsellers before, like we've been publishing books for a long time. Uh, but this is one of the first ones that went like all the way around the world quite quickly. So at first it was published in serial form. So this is something that we used to do in print media, which is where you would release essentially like a chapter of the book every week uh, when the newspaper came out. Um, well, of course, we don't do that anymore, although I guess podcasts are sort of like that. Um, but basically, it was, it was published first in this magazine, which is still a pretty famous magazine. 
And in the first year and a half, it just went nuts, man. Uh, 2.5 million copies, which is kind of insane. And in the first year and a half as well, translated uh, into 22 languages. And I think even more now, uh, again, because we keep making people read it. Um, so people didn't think this would happen. Uh, people thought that a book about the war, especially a first person account about the war would be kind of um, dull and unpopular. And maybe people didn't want to know about that because it had been 10 years since the war, you know, when this came out. So they sort of thought like, aren't we finished with this, you know? Um, but part of the lasting impact of the book was that it helped a lot of people understand uh, what the men in their lives have been through. Like people who hadn't gone to the war could read this book and be like, oh, like, that's why my husband wakes up screaming or like, oh, you know, this is why uh, my son gets that look in his eyes. And so for a lot of people, it helps to sort of put that piece of history together. So the lasting impact, um, again, immense. This is uh, some of the covers, which I thought you might find interesting over here on the right. I especially love that bottom right one, because like, what? Like, it makes it look like a bodice ripping romance, but I imagine that worked, right? Somebody picked it up and then surprise. Um, but basically, it's, it's got a lasting impact. We probably made about 40 million copies by now, which is substantial. Um, and it did get the Nobel Peace Prize a couple of years after it came out. Um, I wouldn't argue that it's a very peaceful book, but I think they sort of wanted to acknowledge the impact that it had, especially on civilians. So, it's a classic. Uh, and, and for good reason, as again, I imagine you've noticed by now. So, um, the... Last thing we're going to talk about today, today's going to be a little bit brief, uh, because frankly I'm concerned that you haven't read the book yet. Um, so today we're mostly going to talk about the, the book's place in history, and then tomorrow we're mostly going to talk about like the characters and the themes. So the last thing that I wanted to tell you about today was the response. Um, and again, this is important in a historical regard, uh, because you know this book came out in 1929, and as we've been talking about, there was a lot of change happening in the world at this point. But specifically, there was a lot of change happening in Germany. Um, so when it came out, um, a lot of people were super excited. Uh, the critical response was major. All of the critics were like, this is the best thing that ever happened, um, in part because nobody had that we know of, really, that have been published, nobody had yet written a first-person account of this war. So everybody had seen this war from the outside. And this was the first ever, um, again, that we published, first-person account of what life was like in the trenches. And so that was a really big deal, because, you know, this war had only just sort of ended, and nobody else had seen what they'd seen. And so there have been a lot of versions of this since. Um, a lot of people come home now and write uh, novels or autobiographies about the wars that they were in, but this was the first one. So basically the clinics were all like, bah, 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 they were all super excited. Um, some of the people who had been there were not. Um, in fact, there were some soldiers, especially this guy who had been in the hospital with Vermark, um, who said that the way that he wrote about the war was inaccurate, um, and that it was too dark, and that it was too negative, and that not everybody was that sad. Um, and so they were basically saying, like, well, you don't speak for us, um, which of course is true. I know, I mean, I would argue he didn't say he was speaking for everyone, but still. Um, I thought this was particularly interesting, the soldier who was next to him in the hospital who said that they didn't all feel this way, that for some of them, uh, protection of the home and the homestead, the, the family, were the highest objective, and to whom this will to protect their homeland gave the strength to endure any extremity. Um, which also, kind of a baller statement. But basically what that soldier is saying is that the honor um, of dying for the fatherland gave a lot of people strength. And so it's kind of an interesting question. And this is one of the things that I'd like to talk to you about on Thursday, this idea of can you feel proud to die for the homeland? Can you feel ashamed to die for the homeland? Can you feel both things? Can you change your mind over the course of the war? Um, is Remark telling the truth and this guy's lying? Is this guy telling the truth and Remark is just a depressed little Eeyore? Like, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a difficult sort of thing to, to reckon with. So often we hear soldiers say this kind of thing that we see here in this quote, this idea that, um, you know, protecting the fatherland is the highest honor. Um, but, and again, this is something that I am hoping that you will explore in your interview papers. Often they say that out loud in front of cameras at events, and privately they say a different thing. So, relatively often what happens, again, in regard to perspective and historical perspective, is that when they are essentially front-facing, when they're audience-facing, when the army can see them, they say something like this, uh, dying for the fatherland is the highest honor, 
when they are at home, when they are private, when they are drunk, when they are sad, they say something vastly different. So the idea that soldiers would speak out and say like, oh, that's not how I felt is really, really interesting to me. Um, especially because one of the responses from other soldiers, especially other soldiers from different countries, was that this was true to them too. So a lot of soldiers uh, from France um, and from Italy and from America read this book and they were like, yeah, yeah, that is how it feels. But again, a few read it and said like, no, that's not what we thought at all. So obviously there could be differences in opinion, but this is one of the things I'm interested in hearing about from you, especially um, if you've already completed your, your interview paper. Um, so <laughs> One of the, the other things that was really interesting about this um, was that a lot of people had essentially opposing viewpoints about what this book wanted. So there was a lot of sort of like conflicting response to it. Um, so for instance, the communists thought it was too sentimental. Uh, they thought that like there were too many feelings about war. Uh, but the fascists thought that it was a slur against the existence of their movement while well, it was, to be fair. Uh, so they were really bad. The fascists were like, why are you making this look bad? Because like, you are a bad bitch. Um, the conservatives thought that it threatened traditional values, which it did, right? Like there's no um, religion in this book. There's no like worship of family in this book, you know, like it's just a sort of an honest account of one single man's experience. So pretty much everybody um, who wasn't a soldier or a literary critic, a lot of them who read it got insulted uh, and, and basically thought that it was garbage uh, and they made that face like that lamb he's my favorite meme hmm. so the other thing that was kind of interesting was that pretty much everybody thought it was propaganda but nobody was sure what it was propaganda for which is kind of fascinating so basically they insisted that it was propaganda for somebody uh for the other side very often and so everybody got mad but everybody had conflicting viewpoints so like some people thought it was propaganda for the war some people thought it was propaganda against the war uh some people thought it was propaganda for the germans like that it made germans look powerful and good and some people thought it was propaganda against the germans that it made them look like you know evil robots uh, some people thought it was just too crude and it was like trying to force this sort of like latrine humor upon the upon the crowds um, so it was, it was kind of interesting in that regard. So some people super loved it and they were like, wow, this is you know, the, the best honest picture we've ever seen. And some people thought that it was like trite propaganda uh, for something that they hated, although which propaganda it was, everybody got confused. So ultimately, um, a lot of the negative response to this book was due to the fact that it is not a cheerful book and it doesn't make anybody look good. And very often we like cheerful books and we like for things to look good. Uh, we like war movies where somebody wins in the end, um, or the good guy specifically. Um, or we like novels where the characters undergo a dramatic uh, transformation, like a character arc as we call it, and end up better. We almost never see a character arc where they end up worse. Uh, that's not something generally that we appreciate, uh, which is part of why I'm sorry that this book is so depressing and I, and I you know, sincerely am, but at the same time, um, war is depressing. So like, I think that it's important that the story is like that. So a lot of people finished this book, maybe much like you, and they were like, what the fuck? You know, like they felt they finished the book and felt more depressed than when they started. Um, and so they described it as a nihilistic slaughter without rationale um, and that the war had been in vain. And so basically a lot of people who finished this book were horrified, um, especially because remember we've been talking so much about propaganda. So a lot of the propaganda, especially in Germany and in America, had argued that the war had been a massive success and everybody was super pleased um, and it had like ended cleanly and neatly and the best guys won. But a lot of other people, uh, again, quietly, um, had argued that it in fact it wasn't. And so to see the, the reality and the sort of like depression exhibited in this book for a lot of people was a, was a massive negative. They didn't want this. They wanted um, a hero story. And instead they got one of the like, you know, well, it's not really an anti-hero, but one of the sort of ultimate like nihilistic stories um, in the sense that basically it didn't make anyone look good. And that's a hard thing, a hard thing. So one of the things um, that really upset a lot of people was this idea that the other soldiers had been just like them the whole time. 
So one of the things that's really important about war is the demonization of the other people. Um, in sociology, very often we call this othering, and it's this idea that you insist that other people are vastly different than you. Like you are the thing, but they are a different thing. And, and you have to, right? Because you're not just going to kill a stranger unless you believe that that stranger is bad or that you need to kill that stranger for your own safety. So very often the propaganda says, one, they're coming for you and they're going to they're going to take your culture. They're going to take your life. They're going to take your women specifically. Um, and two, they're bad. They're bad people and they're evil and they always have been because that's the only way that you can convince a bunch of 19 year olds to commit mass murder. Right. Like they have to believe that they're doing the right thing. So what happened again with this book was that a lot of the soldiers themselves came to this sort of like shocking realization that they had had exactly the same experience as those guys um, and that those soldiers were very much the way that they were. They were all just like confused 19 year olds who signed up for something and then got handed something very, very different. Um, so it was very surprised to be good to you, right? My other favorite. Um, so in, in one of the, the books that's actually pretty famous in core that I chose not to use this semester, they talked about how the soldiers were shocked, especially the soldiers in other countries and especially the readers in other countries, shocked to find out that these boys were just like them. So again, that's one of the most important things about this book was that a lot of people read it and they were like, oh, like it me. <laughs> you know? Like they, they felt seen and they felt sort of acknowledged, but they also felt a little horrified because it turned out that they were, you know, killing boys who were just like them. This is sort of similar, remember we talked about the um, truce that was on Christmas day, there was sort of that pause on the front for Christmas. And this was sort of like that too. Like once you started talking to the other soldiers, you were like, oh shit. We're, we're samesies. Um, and that comes up in the book a lot, this idea that they don't have any beef with the French, uh, but they're going to kill them anyway because they were told to. So perhaps predictably, um, the Nazis were pissed. Um, and so the response among the Nazi party to this book uh, was epic. This was one of the books that they chose as um, like to demonize. This is one of the, the pieces of literature that they picked up and they were like, this is bad. And so Goebbels, who was one of the like all time worst humans, um, and generally speaking, I do not try to, again, like be political, but I'm going to, I'm going to go out on this limb, on this limb here. Sorry, but Goebbels is uh, the worst. Um, and so one of the things that he did was a part of the propaganda arm, he banned movies and he banned books and he had those book burnings and he had this like stormings. And so in 1933, he declared the book verboten. Um, so it was considered really problematic. It was considered really anti-German. And so they would go around and ask that people turn in their copies of this book. Because remember, they had published millions, um, you know, of, of copies of this book. And so there were millions of them floating around Germany. And so they went to the libraries and the bookstores and got every copy they could. Um, they got everybody who was involved in like the youth movement to bring in all of their copies. And they put out all of these like press briefings that said, if you have a copy of this book, you need to turn it in to the Gestapo because it was considered evil. So again, we don't, we don't see something like this much anymore. Um, I can't recall a time we've seen something like this. I mean, sometimes people burn Harry Potter or whatever but like the police don't come and ask your hey butter so this was sort of an epic thing so they went around and like literally collected copies um and here they are cheerfully burning it uh they burned other books too don't get me wrong but this was one of the ones um that was considered vital uh that was considered excessively negative um that they really really focused on so again uh they were hunting this guy they were hunting his books they were hunting his family and all because this book didn't paint germany positively um and i would argue that it didn't paint it super negatively either like he didn't necessarily talk about germany making bad decisions uh, or german people being inherently bad but he did paint it in a realistic light that headed towards the negative. Um, so in that regard, because it wasn't blindingly optimistic and it wasn't like shining golden praise, it was considered bad. Um, Cause the, the Nazis would settle for nothing less uh, than just blind support. So here's some children burning books. And what happened next uh, in regard to the movie was very, very similar. So in 1930, I don't know, let me just skip to the slide, there it is. Um, so in 1930, they made the first movie version. So this is one of the most famous um, 
again, movies from that period in time, and they made another version of this in the 70s, and I think they were going to make another version a few years ago, but I, can't, I couldn't find anything about it. Um, so you may have seen this, uh, or you may have, have seen the posters or something like that. So in 1930, they made it in America, um, not in Germany, which is going to be a vital point here in a minute, and Remark Kelt, uh, he was considered one of the like, consultants, um, and he was on set a lot, so he, he was there for the making of this movie. It was a huge hit. Just a huge hit. Everybody was so excited. Um, and it was really dark and really violent, like in, in keeping with the book, not, not excessive in regard to what they actually talked about in the book. Um, but it was, it was not, again, a happy, clappy, cheerful movie. Uh, but it got very, very popular. It got the, the Oscar, the Best Picture Oscar that year. See, I've shown you guys award winners, right? Um, and it was just a huge hit. But when it came to Germany, all hell broke loose. Um, so basically they were afraid that essentially all hell would break loose because they knew at this point that the Nazi party was like very worried about this book and, and consequently very worried about this movie. Um, so the night of the premiere, they had a bunch of police on hand and they were like, all right, you like, you know, keep an eye out, keep an eye out. And nothing happened the night of the premiere. So the second night they had fewer uh, police and, and things on hand. They only had like a couple. And that was the night, uh, the Goebbels and the, the brown shirts. So the brown shirts were the sort of like proto-Nazis. Um, they hadn't yet necessarily formed into the Nazi party or the Third Reich. They were sort of like on their way. Um, but the brown shirts that you probably have seen um, in pictures or you may have seen in movies, uh, you know, were literally brown, uh, was part of their sort of like self-assigned uniform. Um, so the way that like, you know, the Proud Boys are wearing like khakis. So this was kind of what they did. This, they would wear the brown shirts and they would gather together and they would terrorize people. So they broke into the theater um, and they started setting things on fire. They set the projector on fire and they started literally physically beating anyone in the audience that they suspected of being Jewish. So they didn't beat people who definitely were Jewish. They just beat anyone who they thought might look Jewish, which is going to be a continued problem later on with the Nazis, right? Um, they released a bunch of mice. Um, they released a bunch of pepper. It's not, it's not exactly pepper spray. It's more like sort of pepper balls, but it's not like the pepper balls they've been using on the protesters. It's like powdered pepper uh, and you break it and it makes everybody sneeze. So like the mice and the pepper could be considered a prank. It could be considered like, oh look, now you're sneezing and there's some mice. Um, but the violence and the burning um, and the like organized sort of like fascist element of it was the problem. So basically, it was a huge disaster. Um, and they burned that theater almost all the way down. Um, and by the end of the week, they were just like, you know what, let's just like, let's just not play this movie anymore. So they banned it. Um, so this is a picture, again, um, of the German police getting ready for, for the premiere. Um, the night that it premiered and was chill, they were not ready. Uh, the night that it premiered and was a disaster. So the thing that I want you to know about this that's important is that this night uh, when Goebbels and the brown shirts came out and they like stormed the theater and beat up all those suspected Jews was the first big Nazi violent thing. So they were gearing up like they had been having meetings, they had been having, um, you know, their own propaganda, they had been collecting members, but they hadn't yet acted violently in mass. And this was the first time that they reacted violently and in mass that they like came out swinging, if you will, uh, that they like acted as an organized group. So basically the response to this movie uh, was one of the like beginnings um, of the Third Reich and essentially one of the beginnings of the Nazi party itself. So that's why, again, it happens to be historically important because it really uh, kind of like tipped the scales into a violent uprising um, rather than a just straight up like state run uprising. So. The next thing that we will talk about will be um, you know, the characters and some of the like themes of the book. But I do want to pause there uh, because one of the things that um, happened last week was that I was trying to tell you about the movie and it turned out you hadn't seen it. Um, so I wanted to give you like a little bit more time in case you hadn't finished it yet because it won't make as much sense if we talk about the characters and the themes um, if you hadn't had the chance. So this is excellent novel weather. Uh, there's, there's nothing better right now than to hide under the air conditioning uh, with the book. So. I wouldn't recommend going outside or anything. Well, I don't know where y'all are. Um, but I just, I need you to finish this book before tomorrow so that we can, uh, you know, share all the spoilers. So I'm going to stop recording.